So Moshi is the first open source real-time voice AI ever released. And to explain why we worked on such a, a project, I would like to make a kind of a link between text language models and multimodal language models. So text language models, you have been using them for a while. You had probably a thousand talks already about them. The main idea is that what used to be kind of models used for basic tasks like machine translation, since then have become kind of ubiquitous assistants that you can use for any kind of tasks. You can use them for coding now. You can use them uh, for creative writing. You can even use them to help you uh, in scientific uh, research. So it went from really language model to something that is already much more. And so what is the next step? The next step is that even though these models are kind of now almost, you know, can handle any kind of text-based task, if we really want to make them into useful assistants for everyday life and many tasks, we need to also add other kinds of abilities. Mainly, we need them to be able to understand what they see, understand what they hear, and we also need them to be able to answer us in a natural way, to generate images, and so on and so forth. So you have guessed it. In this talk, I'm going to focus specifically on the second part. So really on how we make an AI that can go from voice to voice directly. So the main question we got when we started working on that is how is this new? So voice AI has been around for uh, more than a decade now, whether it's Amazon Alexa, Siri, Google Assistant, and so on and so forth. Or even the chat GPT voice mode before the really recently released advanced voice mode, which I will talk about later. And what is interesting about this model, and to understand their limitations, let's take a look at how they work. So let's say I want to ask uh, voice AI, what is the square root of 25? The way it works is that a voice activity detection algorithm is going to detect that I've done a spoken query and that I'm finished speaking, and now it's a turn of the LLM. Then a speech-to-text system is going to transcribe my query. Then a language model or kind of natural language understanding system is going to convert this into an answer. And finally, a text-to-speech system is going to answer in very high quality, five. OK. The there are two main problems with that. The first one is that the fact that this pipeline is a pipeline with many complex uh, components means that the typical latency of such kind of system is between three to five seconds. So if you have only one question to ask, it's OK. Now, if you want to have a more lively conversation, it becomes problematic. The second thing is that due to the fact that you go through the information bottleneck of text, which means that at some point, all the information that was non-textual in your query is lost. So if you have the square root of uh, 25, it's fine, because you, you, it's, you provide the same answer whether it's spoken or, uh, or written. But in many cases, what we say conveys much more information than what we say. So, for example, when you, you do a job interview, you're not evaluated only on you know, your knowledge, but also on your speaking, on your uh, conversational abilities, on your ability to socialize, you know, to be a meaningful collaborator and, and productive collaborator, and so on and so forth. So if you wanted to train for interviews with current uh, voice AIs, uh, it would be quite challenging, because first of all, you have to wait a lot between uh, every turn. And also, uh, all the emotional uh, interpretation part of your conversation will be completely lost. So a second big limitation uh, is the limitation between half duplex and full duplex. So what does it mean? Right now, you may think, OK, but we have seen more recent models, in particular, let's say, the advanced voice mode. There are also projects all across industry to reduce the latency to almost zero, right? However, the main, uh, the main constraint that remains on such kind of systems is that they are half duplex. Half duplex is the idea that a conversation is a proper segmentation between a turn of the system and a turn of the human, a bit like a talkie-walkie, right? When you speak on a talkie-walkie, either you are in speaking mode or you are in listening mode. It can go very fast, but both cannot happen at once. If we have an actual conversation with a human, it rather looks like what you see below, which is there is overlap. Uh, sometimes you're just going to say, OK, I see, without interrupting the person. So there is a lot of moments where people speak at the same time, things can go very fast, and so on and so forth. That's what we call a full duplex conversation, where both sides can be active at the same time, any time, with absolutely any kind of conversational dynamics, no hypothesis whatsoever. Which is kind of you know, what a phone provides as an experience compared to a talkie-walkie. An example of that is, so here you see a very messy scene of a World of Warcraft. So, okay, here it's humans 
communicating between them, right? But now, let's say that uh, you wanted to have this kind of games with bots, with whom you need to share complex instructions in high, uh, high level in natural language. So, OK, attack the enemy from this side, use a buff spell, all this kind of stuff. You can have a lot of noise, a lot of people talking at the same time, humans on top of bots, on top of humans, and so on and so forth. So you have this kind of chaotic situation with which us as humans are very comfortable and which is currently impossible to handle with some, such kind of systems. To give you an idea of how it could sound like to have a, an AI you could use for, uh, uh, for MMORPG, uh, I'm showing a, a quick scene I, I recorded uh, yesterday with, uh, with Moshi. Hello, what's up? Hi, Moshi. Uh, let's pretend we are wizards and we are fighting a giant dragon that is coming right to us, okay? Okay. I'll be the wizard and you be the fighter. Okay. How do we start? Okay, so as a wizard, what kind of spell can you cast to protect us? Well, I have a spell called Fireball that can create a ball of fire and throw it at our enemy. Okay, can you cast it right now against the dragon? It's coming closer to us. Sure. I'll cast the spell. Okay, on my side, I will start attacking it with my with my bow. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, so now the dragon is is, tra is targeting me. So do you have any spells that can kind of shield me or protect me from damage? Yeah, I have an ability called Elemental Shield that okay. can absorb some damage from my attacks. Okay, excellent. So uh, can you cast it on me? Sure, I'll cast the spell. Okay, I cut it down because it was a long fight. In the end, we defeated the dragon. And uh, so the main question is, how do we go from this kind of cascaded systems to what we just saw? And the main idea is, how do we go from a pipeline to a single end-to-end -end model? And today, I'm going to share all, as much as I can, technical details about, uh, about this model. Uh, so first, let's take a step back to you know, how a text model works. So a text model, basically, it's a probabilistic model that predicts the next word giving context. So QTA is an AI research lab based, and then you predict the next word. So more technically, in our case, the beginning is a text language model called Helium that we trained at QTA. It's a 7B, and so we train it to predict the next token, then we inject it the next word as input, and so on and so forth. You all know that. OK, so can we just replace these words by audio, right? So now I don't have a written uh, sentence. I have a spoken sentence instead. Can I use it as input and output to the transformer? So something that will look like that. So this is never going to work for a simple reason. Let's take the sentence, QTI is an AI lab based in Paris. Each prediction requires computing the transformer, right? So it means doing a forward call for the 7B parameters model. It's fine for the written form, because the written form is only seven words, pretty compact. However, you know, in a basic uh, rhythm, it takes around three seconds to say this sentence. 24 kilohertz is the kind of quality you can expect for speech. Not great for music, but for speech is typically what you would use. If you have three seconds recorded at 24 kilohertz, it means you have 72,000 values you need to model. So there is no way you are going to fit 72,000 values to your LLM in a full autoregressive way, because it means 10,000 times more token, and due to the quadratic complexity of self-attention, means it's 100 million times more costly to process a sentence as speech than text. So it's just completely inconceivable. So what did we do instead? The main idea behind what are called audio language models is that the first step is to take speech, and rather than using it as a waveform representation, very highly dimensional, compressing it into a representation that is as close as possible to what text is. Which means that we use a compression algorithm. We typically call that a codec, right? So you all know MP3, Opus, and so on and so forth. The, dist the distinction is that, first of all, our codec is a neural network. So it's trained to, do comp to learn to do compression. And it's much more efficient than, let's say, MP3 or Opus. And what it does is that it takes this 24 uh, kilohertz uh, waveform and projects it to 12.5 hertz. So, you know, already the number of time steps has been reduced by 2,000. And the second thing is that this encoder, it takes the waveform and it projects it into kind of a 2D grid that represents time steps, so at 12.5 hertz, and various detail levels. So you can consider that the darker boxes are kind of the coarse information, like the prosody, the dynamic of the sound, basic information about the voice. All the technical acoustic details you know, in, the, in the audio that make its quality are the upper levels. So we have compressed very efficiently uh, audio now. And then we have a decoder, which is a generative adversarial network that takes this 2D grid and reconstructs an audio. 
So the next question is how do we feed this 2D grid to a transformer? Because a transformer is a sequential model, right? It's supposed to take a sequence of tokens. The most naive approach is simply flattening. So you take your 2D grid, you flatten it, typically what is done for images, for example, and you compute uh, your prediction on this flattened sequence, and now you can do generative modeling of audio in this representation space. The problem is that at 12.5 Hz with eight detail levels, for three seconds, you still have 300 tokens, which is much more than seven, right? So it's kind of work. The early language models use this technique of flattening, but it could work for like 10 seconds. Now, if, because otherwise, if you wanted to model a conversation of, let's say, five minutes, you would end up with dozens of thousands of tokens. It will, it will not be scalable. So what we propose instead is a kind of hierarchical model. So now you take all the detail levels for a time step. Instead of flattening them, you sum them at, as input. So on the input side, we are now back from 300 tokens for three seconds to 37, OK? So on the input side, it's solved. Now the output of the model, instead of being a prediction for the next token, it's a continuous embedding. And this embedding goes into a much smaller transformer. In our case, it has 600 million parameters. And this much smaller transformer is going to predict all the detail levels for the current time step. Then we inject them to the next uh, time step, and we do the, the prediction again. So what is nice about that is that now we are down to 37 forward passes uh, through the network. So it's more than seven words, but not that much more. By the way, to be precise, you never give actual words to LLMs. You give tokens that are sub-words, so you know, it's more than seven words. So, so the ratio between audio and text is even better than, uh, than that. So what can you do with that? Now you have a generative model of audio, and you can do everything you can do with a text model. So you are familiar with prompting, where you prompt a model, you let it continue. So you can do the same. Listen to your sister, Morty. To live is to risk it all. Otherwise, you're just an inert chunk of randomly assembled molecules drifting. OK, so I give this uh, five-second prompt to the model, and I let it con generate some continuation. Listen to your sister, Morty. To live is to risk it all. Otherwise, you're just an inert chunk of randomly assembled molecules drifting entangled in the ether. You don't think so? All right, fine, then listen to your sister. Do you want to make it in the world? They're going to die alone with nothing but their kindness. Oh, no, Listen to your sister, Morty. To live is to risk it all. Otherwise, you're just an inert chunk of randomly assembled molecules drifting in the gases in a vacuum of space time. Live and love. OK, this one is more positive. Sorry for the small hiccup. It's often uh, some playback issues with this kind of audio. So now we have a continuation model. However, continuation is not really the task we are interested in. We want to make a dialogue system. Again, the most basic thing we can do is doing the talkie-walkie, OK? So basically, we have the sequence of tokens a long time, and we are going to just say that some of them are for the user, and some of them are for the LLM. So for example, what you see on the slide right now is that I asked a question, the LLM answered something, I asked a second question, and now the model is uh, predicting his, his answer. So that's fine. That's pretty much everything that exists right now. Even all the most sophisticated voice AIs you can use right now uh, is great for a lot of tasks, but it does not model overlap of real conversations. Because again, you know, it, it's seen as a sequence where either you are in listening mode or in speaking mode. So the second innovation behind Moshi that we call multi-stream modeling is a very simple idea, is that now the model it generates only the voice of the LLM, right? What it needs to generate. But it consistently models two separate streams of tokens. So instead of having just a sequence of tokens, you have two. One that represents the user, one that represents the system. And sometimes the user is going to be silent, but we're going to feed silent tokens. Sometimes the user is going to be silent, we're going to do the same. But now, when the model is speaking, it still listens. Uh, it, can, it can interrupt you. You can interrupt it. Any kind of dynamics can happen. You know, several people can talk at the same time, and the model is pretty flexible with that. Sorry. So now that we have uh, an algorithm, we need training data. So if we want to train a conversational agent, we need to train on spoken conversations. One big difficulty for us is that this kind of data is very scarce. Because if you want to teach your model what is its role in the conversation, you need to have kind of stereo data where one channel is a user and one channel is a speaker. A kind of uh, academic data set that allows making prototypes is called Fisher. It's 2,000 hours of phone calls recorded in the US between 1994 and 2002. And 
The nice thing is that if you train uh, Moshi on that, you can do kind of an almost paranormal experience where you can give a phone call to the early 2000s. Hello, my name is Bob. What's your name? Hi, this is Jay. Nice to meet you, Jay. Where are you from? I'm called from South Arizona. Oh, brilliant. So you're American? Yes. So you know about the US, right? Sorry? So you know about the US? Yes. Okay, so who's the president right now? The President Bush. Oh, okay. And uh, I heard he, he met the president of France recently. Yes, I heard that too. What's his name again? His name is Jay Rock. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so you, so you know a lot. Do you, do you have a, a computer? I have a computer, I have a cell phone. Okay, what, what kind of computer and cell phone is that? The cell phone is a Motorola. Okay, and, and the computer? A computer is a Dell. Is a Dell, okay. And what is... Laptop. What, what, kind of, uh, what kind of operating system do you have on your computer? Windows 2000. Windows 2000? Oh, brilliant. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> we had a lot of fun with that, honestly, uh, having discussion about the internal bubble uh, collapse and so on. However, it's not very useful uh, in the daily life, right? So facing this scarcity of data, what we did is that we had to create synthetic data. So what we did is that we developed a text-to-speech system with unprecedented voice cloning abilities that can generate dialogues with both voice. So currently, for example, you have probably played with the excellent work on Notebook LM. You can think about something like that, so something that can generate uh, natural dialogues. And to specify the voice of Moshi, we hired a voice artist, and we recorded her in a studio playing a lot of scenarios with emotions, like playing, being scared, whispering, playing a cowboy, various kind of scenarios, right? And then we use this text-to-speech system to generate uh, synthetic data. So to give you an idea of uh, the quality of the voice cloning uh, TTS with emotion, this is uh, synthetic voices generated by our system. Hey, this time I'm not chatting, but rather being controlled by text. I can express more than 70 emotions and speaking styles. Like whispering. Or maybe I could sing the song. I can sound terrified. Or impersonate a pirate, ahoy matey. I can even speak with a very French accent, just like my inventors. Looking forward to interacting with you. So this is a synthetic voice based on the voice of Alice, our voice actress. And again, then we generate these synthetic dialogues where you know, we create kind of scenarios where someone is going to ask Moshi for either doing role playing or doing a specific task. Uh, asking a question of knowledge, asking the square root of 25, this kind of stuff. Is this an example of this kind of synthetic uh, conversation? Hello, what's going on? Do you watch drama series? If so, which one? Yeah, I do. There are so many good ones out there. Can you tell me about the one you watch? Well, one of my favorites is Perry Mason. Ooh. Yeah, it's an American legal drama series. Okay, so. The nice thing is that we generate both audio on separate channels with the multi-stream technique, and so then we can you know, teach to the model what is its role and uh, how to interact with users. So far, we generated a few hundred thousand of hours of this data, and that's what we use to train Moshi. So what's the conclusion of this talk? So Moshi is the first full duplex voice AI existing right now, and not only we developed it and provided it uh, through an online demo. Uh, our laboratory is fundamentally a research laboratory. So we released weights and codes, and we wrote a 60-page research paper with absolutely every single technical detail that will allow you to re-implement the algorithm. And we are working on releasing the training code. Our goal is to favor and facilitate as much as possible adoption for research and commercial purposes of the technology behind voice agents. You can even, if you have a MacBook Pro M3, you can just run these two commands, and you can run the model on device locally, because it's a compact model, and its quantized version can run on the latest generation of a MacBook. I have a small video of Moshi talking to Moshi, but for the sake of time, I suggest you follow Oni on Twitter and check the videos there. Thanks a lot for your attention.